We talk a lot about different MCMC methods on this podcast because they are the workhorses of the Bayesian models, but other methods exist out there in the wild to infer the posterior distributions of your models, like sequential Monte Carlo, for instance, or also known as SMC. What? You've never heard of SMC? Well, perfect, because Nicolas Chopin is going to tell you all about it in this episode. A lecturer at the French University of Ensay since 2006, Nicolas is one of the world experts on SMC. Before that, he graduated from École Polytechnique and Ensay, where he also did his PhD from 1999 to 2003. Outside of work, Nicolas enjoys spending time with his family, practicing Aikido and reading a lot of books. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics with not one, but two French accents, episode 82, recorded April 11, 2023. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, for any info about the podcast, learnbasedstats.com is la place to be. Show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbasedstats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.endora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbaystats.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Wes Abazian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. Abazian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen. Maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like I'm Richard Feynman? Hello, my dear Bayesians. I am very happy to welcome yet another member in our LBS Patreon community. This time, I am talking about the fantastic Kurt Tickelstow. Thank you so much, Kurt. I'm super grateful for your support. It helps for a lot of things, podcast-wise, but especially for editing. And I am looking forward to talking with you in the LBS Slack. Oh, another thing I wanted to share with you. My friend and fellow PMC developer Maxim Kochurov has put together a series of webinars that he calls State of Base. Honestly, I've seen the content and it is breathtaking. So I had to share it with you on the podcast. And if you are a data practitioner and want to deepen your understanding of Bayesian modeling, I strongly encourage you to check it out. Maxim walks you through advances in practical methods, how to introduce prior knowledge, the big concepts of advanced statistical models. You go from A-B testing to linear regression, from Gaussian processes to time series. It is a trove of Bayesian wisdom, I swear. And even better, it is completely free. You can subscribe on Meetup to attend the upcoming webinars, and you can check out PyMC Labs YouTube channel to watch past lessons from Maxim. And of course, I put the links in the show notes. What did you expect? Okay, now let's talk SMC with Nicolas. Nicolas Chopin, bienvenue sur Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thank you. Merci. So yet again, a French person. Damn, I'm starting to expand the universe of Bayesian French people. And I'm really happy to have you on the show. Several people have been recommending you, including Bob Carpenter and Osvaldo Martin. So thank you to the both of you, Bob and Osvaldo, if you're listening. And Nicola is on the show now. And uh, actually, Nicola, I think you're the first one from the NSA University to be on the show. So I'm quite, I'm quite glad. I'm also glad to hear that 
Bayesian stats are taught and in good hands with you at the NSA. I don't know if other people know about <laughs> NSA, but me as a French educated person, of course I know about NSA. So I'm, I'm pretty happy to have you on the show and thank you for taking the time. Thank you. So as usual, I have so many questions for you. <laughs> so, so that listeners know kind of a summary, we'll be talking mainly about SMC, Sequential Monte Carlo, because that's one of your specialties. We will also talk a bit about INLA in, so that's integrated nested Laplace approximation, which a lot of listeners have been asking about. The show is going to be mainly about SMC because that's really your specialty, but you also are very knowledgeable about INLA. So I wanted to take that opportunity before actually having the opportunity to do a full show about INLA. And so basically that's going to be that. But of course, as usual, let's start with your origin story. So can you tell us, Nicola, how did you come to the stats and data world and how sinuous of a path? That was. My path to applied mathematics was quite direct because I was always a fan of mathematics. When I was a kid, I remember reading a magazine and there was this scientist who was doing applied mathematics for uh, rocket science, actual rocket science. I said, wow, applied mathematics, that's what I want to do. So I'm not annoyed. It's not very original, but I always wanted to do math. But in France, going to stats, People, of my, at least for my generation, it's not so obvious because you, we were not taught statistics at, uh, in high school and uh, in universities or grand école, you learn probability maybe in the third year of undergraduate degree and maybe stats later. And it was a bit looked down. So, and also, this is maybe not very interesting to, to the listeners, but, uh, uh, at the beginning, I wanted uh, to go to computer science. I was a bit of a nerd. I guess I'm still a nerd. And <laughs> I wanted to do computer science. And for some reason, I ended up at the answer. I really hated economics. Oops. That's, <laughs> maybe I should not do that often. And uh, that was not my thing. But uh, the stats part was the, the part that really attracted me most. It was not talked so well at the time. Again, oops, I should not say that so directly. And uh, I hope we do a better job than uh, we used to, but still, I really liked it and I got interested. And I, uh, maybe it's interesting to mention at the time, I had no idea what was machine learning because at the time, statistics was really detached. There was like a wall between uh, probability and statistics and machine learning at the same time. So, yeah, that's the gist of it. But, um, yeah. I applied mathematics from the start, but statistics took me more time. Mm -hmm. But I guess it's quite common, uh, this kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, I can guess, at least for the, the French educated people, me, it was exactly the same thing, actually. was much more into math, and it's true that you get taught much more, at least at the time. I don't know now. I hope it changed. It's <laughs> but, better. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the fact that you're teaching at NSA is just like the first, the first uh, testimonial that it did change. But um, it's true that, yeah, me, I did a lot of linear algebra, a lot of basically very conceptual math, which I loved, to be honest. Linear algebra is actually super useful also. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't teach linear algebra. It's like a very a pillar of the, the methods we are, we're using today. But stats, for me at least, was just really awful because it was only pen and paper stats. And so that was super boring. <laughs> I was like, and I'm not that good of a, you know, compute, I'm not a machine. So I, I don't compute that fast and that reliably. And so it's like, I don't understand why I'm doing that stuff, you know, and also it limits the kind of problems that you can work on because you have to compute with your brain and the human brain is not really good at that. So I just like, I was like, I don't really understand the problems I'm working on and I don't see how they are interesting. Whereas if you had taught me statistics the way I learned it later on by myself, which was with a computer and simulating distributions and simulating events and scenarios, well then I would, I think I would have been hooked way faster because it's just awesome to simulate everything and see basically the, the distributions existing in front of you. I'm into that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, if if we have time, for sure, we'll we'll talk about a bit more about that educational aspect because I'm really curious about how you see that and how you do that at NSA. 
But first, maybe can you tell us actually, so you said you started more with applied math really early, but now you're doing way more of a stats oriented research. And so how did that happen? <laughs> oh, well, um, so now I guess I got, it's a bit like you said, I mean, initially uh, stats didn't look so exciting, but uh, mm -hmm. it's really um, following Christian's Robert's course, which was when well, Christian was my PhD advisor, but mm -hmm. I started to see the connection between uh, computation and statistics and And Bayesian statistics also was uh, very appealing to me. And uh, mm -hmm. that's how I progressively turned towards uh, statistics in the, I mean, in the last year at the end, so I, I mean, following Christian's course mostly. Oh, I see. I'm not okay. sure I understood. I really understand. No, no, yeah, uh, that's, that's exactly my question. question but, uh, yeah, mm. yeah. Okay, yeah, and I see. Christian, Christian was a big influence on me, uh, even before I, I did a PhD with him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But to, I mean, maybe I should not be said too openly, but Christian's teaching, uh, where an undergraduate students, there will be two or three students like me who will really like it. <laughs> And big majority will uh, find it, it goes too fast, oh, yeah. too many things. So, yeah, <laughs> it's not, uh, not the majority might appreciate it. It's <laughs> At the time, it was super fast when he was teaching, but I used to, I really loved it personally. Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, that's really cool to hear about these mm -hmm. non, like kind of life changing courses, classes in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about Bayesian stats in particular? Do you remember when you first got introduced to them? So, so to be a bit more precise, what happened is that I was, um, So I did polit école polytechnique in France and I, I end up with, uh, at the end of polytechnique, you might, uh, go to this, uh, special tracks for civil servant. And I did that, but I was really unsure about my choice. And in this track, you, so you go to the answer, for instance, in my case. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I realized I would need to do a PhD. And I, I had to contact people in the administration to be sure I could do PhDs. And they said, oh, it should be about economics, econometrics. And there was this one econometrician who wanted to play a bit with Bayesian statistics. Mm -hmm. So that's why I got in touch with Christian Robert, even before I started this course. And I started reading his book and I started to discover MCMC and Bayesian statistics at the same time. So I got really excited about it even before starting his course. So he started, that's, uh, yeah. And, um, uh, yeah, I guess the idea of, uh, staying in the world of probability, that's what Bayesian statistic does. So probability is beautiful. It's very technical, but it's quite beautiful. And with Bayesian statistics, you're still in the realm of probability. I think that's what really appealed to me. Whereas, uh, standard statistics, classical stuff, it's always, oh, we have this problem. Let's do this, uh, let's do this, and with a problem, let's do this. It, it looks much less principled. Mm -hmm. At least to my uh, naive eyes at the time, it looked like that. So it looks like Bayesian statistics was much more principled, and a very nice idea. You represent your, uh, your uh, prior uh, knowledge or lack of knowledge for a distribution, and then you get a posterior. I got the gym immediately and I, I stick to it. Yeah. I mean, I, can... I used to teach uh, a statistics course and it was funny because I could see some students really ticked with Bayesian statistics. The others were not happy with it. So I guess there's something in your brain. Some people are Bayesian and some are not. I don't know. But anyway. Yeah. I mean, that's actually a topic I, I like talking about in the, in the podcast, especially with neuroscientists. So episode 77 is actually a lot like about that with Pascal Wallish. And uh, I think episode, yeah, episode 81 with Alan Stalker, where we go into that and like, especially how people visualize, perceive visual speed, for instance, which is really related to priors and help you understand which parts of the brain brain are actually Bayesian and which parts are, are not. And uh, that's uh -huh. a pretty fascinating um, topic. Uh, I'll definitely put these two episodes in the show notes for uh, people who want to who dig deeper if they haven't listened to them. Uh -huh. And actually, so now, can you define 
for listeners the work that you're doing nowadays and the topics that you are particularly interested in. Right. So I'm still very much interested in bit the fundamentals of Monte Carlo. So just even if you're not in statistics, you just want to approximate an integral. How do you do it? And that's funny because it's uh, there's still work to be done. Mm -hmm. There's still stuff to, to result to establish. We don't have the final word yet, so that's kind of fun. And um, you don't necessarily consider um, a posterior distribution as your target could be anything. But sometimes knowing about statistics gives you insight about constructing good Monte Carlo algorithms. Mm -hmm. So to be to be a bit more precise, I'm talking about uh, I have this recent paper with Mathieu Gerber where uh, we try to answer the following question: You want to compute an integral in dimension d. And your budget is an evaluation of your, fun your integrand f. What is the best rate of uh, convergence you can get for your approximation? Vanilla Monte Carlo would be square root one of the square root of n, but you can actually do better if you're ready to assume that your function is um, is smooth in some sense. Yeah. And so these results, they are results that tells you the optimal rate if you have. Uh, for whatever random algorithm, the optimal rate will be one of the n power minus one half minus r of a d, where r is the regularity and d is the dimension. Mm -hmm. It has been known since the fifties. And with Mathieu, we managed to come up with, um, algorithms that reach these optimal rates. Ah, okay. And, um, I'm not the, we are not the only one to work on this. François Portier from, uh, from Rennes and Sailly. It is uh, uh, associated to the answer, but it's in Rennes in France. He has another paper with uh, Rémi Leluc where he looks, they look at the same problem and they come up with a different solution. Mm -hmm. So that's funny because Monte Carlo is like an old method. I mean, I mean Vanilla Monte Carlo. Yeah. There are, but there are still stuff to be done in this direction. So that's one thing. And also these days I work a lot on Sequential Monte Carlo samplers. Mm -hmm. So that's where you use uh, sequential Monte Carlo, maybe to sample from one fixed distribution. Even if you define a sequence of distribution, you're actually interested in just a single distribution. And, um, so I've done work recently on that, trying to come up with uh, more efficient SMC samplers. And I'm still working on it. That's a bigger part of my research. And these days happen to supervise PhD thesis, which are more applied, which is very interesting too. So one in cardiology with a cardiologist where we try to predict uh, sudden death. That's, uh, I'm smiling, but uh, that's a pretty uh, dramatic uh, problem. And if we could uh, predict that people have a uh, high chance of getting sudden death, you could maybe save lives. And, uh, and uh, other applied work on cosmology and uh, cognitive sciences. But each time I was lucky to end up with PhD students who wanted to do this kind of applied work. And that's, that's difficult, but it's also very rewarding. And uh, also you need to find colleagues in other areas of science who want to work with you. But uh, it's something I also do and I, I find it really interesting too. That was actually like, you kind of answered my next questions, which was related to, yeah, you're doing very theoretical stuff. And basically I wanted you to explain us how, like which impact it actually has and then like the, the applications. And I mean, you basically answered, I didn't even know you were doing like the, all these different, uh, very different applications. That sounds really, really interesting. So please put any links in the show notes to any papers or thesis or anything that came out of that, because I think people are going to be very interested. So yeah, like any cosmology papers or medicine papers, or even your, your the paper uh, you mentioned, uh, you just did to put that improving Monte Carlo algorithms. For sure. That's awesome because uh, I'm sure there's, there are all types of listeners on this podcast. So, uh, they will all be happy with that. For sure. This will be in the show notes, people. So definitely take a look. So actually, yeah, you mentioned it. And I think now is a good time to dive a bit into that sequential Monte Carlo, because that's really one of your main areas of research. So we haven't talked a lot about that on the show yet. Can you basically tell us 
what Sequential Monte Carlo is to start with? Yes, I think it's important to start with that. Thank you for this question because there's a few misconceptions about SMC. So I like to start with saying that um, I think most people have heard about SMC, but they, they're a bit confused because uh, by SMC, we mean slightly different things. So on one hand, they are what I would call a particle filter. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of SMC algorithm you use uh, in a specific scenario when you have uh, time series data and you want to learn sequentially uh, some latent variable from your model. So the model will be hidden Markov or a state space model. And uh, this model arises a lot, for instance, in, um, in signal processing where you want to track a boat or a car or to do car navigation, stuff like that. So XT yeah. would be your uh, hidden state. Population models also. Yeah. Population yeah. models, for instance, of like uh, you're trying to infer the population of sharks or things like that. And actually, for our listeners, there is a whole episode about HMM's hidden mark of models. I'll put that in the show notes. It was with uh, Vianney Leos Barajas, who is doing cool work, but that is especially for that these kinds of models. So yeah, mm. I'll let you continue, Nicola. Yeah, so when you have a hidden Markov model or a model uh, which is a dynamic model with a dynamic uh, state hidden variables, you might want to do filtering. So filtering is trying to recover this latent variable sequentially. And then you do this kind of sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. Mm -hmm. A related approach is uh, the Kalman filter. Mm -hmm. uh, the Kalman filter is, um, is what you do when you have a specific type of state space model, which is linear and Gaussian. And then computing the filtering distribution is like computing the mean variance of a certain uh, Gaussian distribution. And then you can do everything uh, exactly. So you don't need no Monte Carlo. And uh, Kalman the Kalman filtering uh, has been popular since the 60s, the 70s. It's really important in a lot of uh, signal processing tasks and other problems. But if your problem is not linear or, Ga and or Gaussian, you do uh, maybe a particle filter. So that's one thing, and that's very interesting. And I did some work on this. I think I'm not the main contributor. It's a, a lot of people have worked on this. Yeah, but that's really... Thanks for talking about that because it's not something I've covered a lot during the um, on the show so that's cool that you're mentioning that and I saw I saw also that you added a two-hour introduction to particle filters that you did on YouTube and that's in the in the show notes folks so if you're interested in particle filters definitely take a look at that and uh, the other thing when we say SMC we might also mean uh, SMC samplers mm -hmm. which are um, Algorithm that um, and they, they, they are the same type of algorithm because you do something sequentially and what you do sequentially is to simulate uh, random variables and you compute weight for an important sampling step and then you might have some Markov step. But what is different is uh, no, you consider any sequence of distribution. It doesn't need to be related to the Markov model. Mm -hmm. And in particular, you could be interested in sampling from a posterior distribution, but you just introduce a, a sequence of distribution. For instance, it could be the prior, then the posterior given one data point, when two data points, three data points. Or instead, you could do a tampering, where between the prior and the posterior, you consider the a pseudo posterior, which would be prior times likelihood power something, and where the exponent is between 0 and 1, and you try to interpolate between the prior and posterior. Or it could be any sequence of distribution, and maybe you're really interested in each member of the sequence, or maybe you're just creating an artificial sequence to sample from the terminal uh, distribution, which is the distribution of interest. Okay, and then when you do this kind of thing, and in particular where uh, the way you mutate the, the particles is through MCMC MC steps. Then we're in the realm of SMC samplers. And that's why it, uh, and, uh, and if I may add a few words about this, the, the advantage of SMC samplers, I mean, because you could uh, use MCMC MC instead, but the big advantage is that, uh, well, some of the big advantages is that, uh, because you, you have, um, uh, many particles together, then it's much easier to uh, 
parallelize your algorithm compared to MCMC, which is sequential in nature. So you have this uh, parallelization, which comes for free, which is embarrassingly easy to do. And uh, also compared to MCMC, you get an estimate of uh, marginal likelihood, which is something difficult to get in MCMC. And uh, third advantage is that because you have this uh, particle sample at every time t, it makes, uh, if you try to come up with uh, recipes to automatically uh, choose certain tuning uh, parameters of the algorithm, it's much easier. But just easier, sorry. Just because you have a population of uh, points rather than one point in, in standard MCMC. I hope this is clear uh, to the listeners, but... Um, What I'm trying to say is that adaptive MCMC is essentially hard because at every time t you just have one point. Or maybe you have a complete chain, but maybe it was started in a bad state. Maybe you're not mixing so well. Whereas in uh, SMC samplers, you have many particles and we have ways not to make sure they are almost, if you resample a small number, they are essentially follow from the current target distribution. You just started me on my favorite subject, so I'll talk for 10 minutes, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope, uh, please no, interrupt, cool. is there anything you want me to clarify? Yeah, so all the different topics you just talked about right now, so hidden Markov models, um, particle filters, all the different types of models you've just mentioned are more appropriate, it would be very appropriate to use an SMC method or an SMC sampler because it will be more efficient. In which model or problems, statistical problems, will I use SMC samplers? Essentially, in any situation where you could uh, use uh, a Metropolis uh, kernel instead, like uh, even maybe uh, Nuts or uh, Langevin, etc. The reason I'm saying this is because uh, you could find models where um, You would like to do Gibbs sampling instead, and maybe a Gibbs sampler would be hard to beat because the Gibbs sampler, the big advantage is that it really takes into account the specific structure of your, uh, of your model. Mm -hmm. That said, I mean, I'm being known uh, to be a bit critical of Gibbs sampling, and I wrote a paper with a colleague on uh, logistic regression. And for this particular problem, we found that Gibbs sampling was not actually very competitive with even random walk metropolis. Because the big drawback of Gibbs samplers on the other hand is that they are very specialized. You give me a model, you give me a prior, maybe I can derive a Gibbs sampler. And I change a bit the prior, and you have to work again and derive another Gibbs sampler. So maybe you use uh, then uh, bugs or related software to, the, to derive uh, the Gibbs sampler for you. But still, it's a very specialized tool And it requires a lot of work compared to uh, Randomo Petropolis or other approaches like that. We just require you to be able to compute the log, the, the log target density. But there must be cases, I'm pretty sure, um, in the, all the statistical models you consider, uh, you may consider you can end up in a situation where Gibbs samplers are the only viable option. I'm ready to believe that. But if you're not in such a case where it's, In my view, SMC samplers can be used uh, in uh, any other problem where you would do instead uh, MCMC or any kind of Metropolis sampler, Langevin, uh, Nuts, uh, Random Walk, whatever you're fancy. So yeah, I think a good thing also to give listeners an idea is, and you started doing that a bit, so feel free now to dive a bit more into that. Maybe give people an intuition of what the main difference is between MCMC and SMC samplers is basically. And that will also, I think, give people in, an intuition of where, when and where SMC would be interesting for their problems. That's a tricky one, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's you, you. because my understanding of this has uh, changed recently. Mm -hmm. The thing to see is that when you use a SMC sampler, At time t, uh, when you uh, resample the particles, you have to move them according to MCMC kernel. So we're using MCMC essentially. And uh, we have this recent paper with, uh, which I will add to the show notes. I have this recent paper with uh, Ai Dongdo, my former PhD student, where uh, we propose a slightly different type of SMC sampler called a waste-free SMC. 
and we derive the asymptotic uh, variance and we get an asymptotic variance which is very much the same as you would if you would use uh, the MCMC kernel you use at time t. So you could say it's not better, not worse MCMC, it's exactly the same, right? So we're using MCMC. We are not doing better than MCMC or worse, in a sense. But what we gain is that we have, as I said before, we gain this ability to do like independent MCMC chains a bit by construction. So that's good for parallelization. And that's also, we also in this paper propose a way to estimate the asymptotic variance, which is based on the remark that doing this algorithm, you have almost like an independent chain, so you can just do the, the empirical variance, right? And also the third point I made before, yes, essentially, so the way to understand what we do is that we define a sequence of distribution. We go for this different distribution for uh, reweighting steps, etc. Then we do this MCMC steps. So at, yes, at every time t, it looks like we, we do MCMC. But for instance, let's say we do random oak metropolis. The big issue with random oak metropolis, you get very bad performance if you don't calibrate the random oak steps. It's uh, critical. But here you have your current particle sample that tell you exactly, uh, not exactly, but gives you a very good idea of the uh, shape of the current distribution. And you can use that to calibrate your random monk metropolis. We are not doing better than MCMC, but we, we kind of get like the best of MCMC. Whereas if you just do standard MCMC or even adaptive MCMC, that would be hard to get. That's, uh, that's my pitch. I don't know how obviously clear it is, but. Plus again, parallelization. I mean, for instance, if you know Jax in Python, there's this guy, Rémi Leloup, that you might have already interviewed him maybe, who is a developed Black Jax. So in Black Jax, they have did a waste-free SMC already. And if you use this, then uh, your SMC sampler is going to be implemented more or less automatically on the GPU. And it's going to be 100 times faster than any MCMC, just because it's it's parallel and uh, you use uh, the GPU, you uh, exploit this property. Yeah, that's really cool. I'm sorry, it's hard to be really to explain this properly because it's a bit subtle. No, I think you're doing a good job. That's, that's pretty hard. <laughs> and I mean, uh, this is like this episode is here to introduce people to the to the topics and then they can see if it actually fits what they are working on or what they are curious about these days. And then if they are definitely refer to the show notes or get in touch with me or with Nicola and um, and then you'll, you'll get going. If I could add a story that maybe would make clarify that like, the oh, sure. this a bit better, is I have this colleague, Robin Ryder, who um, is doing great work on um, applied Bayesian statistics and uh, in uh, linguistics, for instance, it's really nice stuff. Actually, you, you might consider inviting him because he, his talks are always very, very interesting. And... Uh, he gave this talk where he started. Uh, so I think we all agree that uh, the only reason we do SMC uh, is because uh, in, uh, usually it's because Nicolas in the room we want to be uh, to make him happy. Otherwise, uh, but if, this is a problem where we started to do MCMC and we never managed to make it work. So we turned to SMC, and uh, so they had this. Um, I plot problem, which was, uh, in their posterior was quite high dimensional. It, there was some structure, but no obvious way uh, to, to exploit it. And the, whatever kind of MCMC they tried to use, impossible to, to, to get a decent performance. And in the end, they did this, um, tampering SMC approach. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so tampering is just a way to define a certain sequence of distribution. And then they manage to make it work. So just to say, I mean, uh, there are people who, uh, actually end up with very hard problems because they, their posterior is high dimensional and very hard to calibrate. And if you try, uh, SMC, it's not really SMC that saves you. It's that, uh, using SMC, you could use, for instance, tampering. And with tampering, uh, you can start at the distribution where it's easy to move around quickly, and then you progressively reduce the temperature. 
And in the end, uh, and you, you really get something that starts to work. So <laughs> I just want to say, I mean, uh, there are still not so many people who are convinced, but uh, I've already had an uh, example in the wild of uh, concrete, difficult problems where uh, the claims I'm making on this show are actually uh, shown to uh, actually uh, old uh, in this case, at least. Yeah, no, definitely super interesting. And yeah, so I, I encourage people who are interested to to look at the show notes and, and study all of these because, um, I mean, I'm definitely super curious about that and also read, read <laughs> about it because, I mean, it's another way of getting to the posterior distributions and so it's never very intuitive it's always it always takes a bit of time to get familiarized to it so if you're completely lost don't worry that's completely normal and it comes from time and repetition and actually using those tools so oh yeah and actually before diving into when does SMC break basically the frontiers right now of of SMC actually for people who want to try out SMC do you have any package that you would recommend? How can people try that out in their own work and projects? So I've developed this uh, Python package called Particles. Mm -hmm. I'm a nasty PhD advisor, so I forced my PhD student to use it. And this way I can see where the documentation is not so great and stuff. And also I, I say PhD student, but also I have um, I teach a course on SMC at the end uh, third year. So I uh, recommend the students to use it. And from here to, I can see every year the proportion increases. So the documentation is getting better and better. So yes, I mean, you can use uh, my package and uh, I developed it while writing uh, this book I wrote with uh, Omiros Papalsipulios Puyo. So it was uh, meant to, uh, to illustrate the book, but also it implements all this uh, uh, waste free SMC samplers for different scenarios. And uh, alternatively, again, in Blackjax, you have uh, an implementation of waste-free SMC. So that's another option. Uh, I've not played with it so much, but that's the uh, two implementation I'm familiar with. Otherwise, you will might find mostly uh, code that people have developed for a certain project, but uh, that's the, two, uh, the only two packages I know which try to, to offer uh, a general package you might use in different scenarios. Yeah. And it's on GitHub. And if you don't understand how to use it, uh, feel free to, to, to raise an issue on GitHub and I'll try to answer it quickly. I just added Blackjacks to the show notes. So yeah, when you have uh, the time, definitely add your, the link to your package particles to the show notes. Uh, is that on like, can people just uh, conda install it or pip install it? Perfect. Too. Folks, it's available on Peep and Conda, so just install away and we'll put a link to the GitHub repo in the show notes so that um, people can, can look around and if you find any issues, open one on the GitHub and if you know how to solve it or are willing to learn how to solve it, well, open a PR. I'm sure Nicola will be absolutely thrilled. <laughs> Okay, so that's cool. So people can use that. And then one question will be, so what are the current frontiers of SMC right now? So what I mean by that, by that is when does it break and when should it be avoided preferentially? I have this uh, not so recent paper with uh, Pierre Jacob and uh, Alexander Buchholz where we managed to make it work in like uh, dimension 4000. So dimension is not such an issue, at least if you use specifically tampering sequences, I think. But I'm not sure that SMC sample, the type of SMC sampler I'm talking about will work so well if you had a high dimensional problem with very separated modes. Because I, as I told you, you get the, you manage to get the best out of MCMC, but MCMC is not so good at uh, jumping from one region to the other. So yes, multi multimodality is still not uh, something that is handled gracefully by SMC samplers, just because the MCMC kernel we're gonna use are not uh, so well suited for that. So when you use tampering, at least at the beginning, you, you move around between the different regions because tampering uh, like uh, reduced drastically the 
like the, the walls between the, the different regions. So you, you, you might manage to get a lot of particles everywhere, but uh, then when, uh, so it will still be better than just a standard MCMC, but uh, not great. So that's one of the things I want to work. Uh, that's one of my projects at the moment to uh, try to make SMC samplers work better. More generally, in uh, for problems where the posterior is far from Gaussian, right? Like not, yeah, like because multimodality is uh, it's a funny problem. But in the end of the day, I mean, people always look at uh, target distribution, which is a mixture Gaussian mixture, and we don't really care about that. And I'm not sure that uh, people mod model people use always have uh, so many uh, well separated mods. Maybe, maybe not. But also you could imagine like banana shapes or weird shapes that are difficult to explore. That's still uh, something we need to improve, I would think. That's good to know. I'm guessing that uh, these are topics that you are, uh, that you're working on. <laughs> and yeah, actually on that, I'm curious in like the next improvement that you'd like to see on SMC, what would it be? Well, that's exactly that. I mean, I want to, uh, I just, don't want to reveal too much because it's uh, the topic of a PhD uh, project that might start in September. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, as I said before, the very nice thing about SMC samplers is that you have a sample that you can use to learn uh, features of your distribution to better calibrate your MCMC step. And uh, I want to improve this part for... Uh, nasty posteriors or nasty targets, which by nasty, I mean uh, really uh, weird shapes, uh, high dimension, whatever, stuff like that. So I have some ideas and I have a, I have a student who is willing to, <laughs> to do this PhD. So that's, uh, yeah, that's the kind of thing I like to, to work on. And um, maybe also looking into um, machine learning techniques like uh, Neural networks and flows could be useful, but uh, I'm not sure. I mean, that's something we could look into as well. Thanks a lot for that overview of SMC. That's super cool. We've never done that on the show yet that I remember because now it's been almost 90 episodes. So it's a long time, but um, that's awesome. I hope that will be useful to people. I'm pretty sure the show notes will be quite full for this episode, folks. So if you are interested, that if you're curious about it, definitely take a look. Now we're going to switch a bit and actually talk about another method that you are familiar with, even though um, you're saying that you're, you're not that familiar with, but I think a lot of people would disagree. And that's called INLA. So that stands for Integrated Nested Laplace Approximations. And well, actually I have pending to invite one of the main INLAS inventors, whose name is Harvard Ru. I'm working on getting him on the show, folks, and uh, Nicola actually <laughs> is going to help me. But while we, in the meantime, while we're waiting for a Harvard and we'll do a full INLA episode, Nicholas, can you give us the rundown about INLA and basically Tell listener what this is about. What does integrated nested Laplace approximations mean? All right. So the key word here, important one, is the Laplace approximation. And it's uh, in line is uh, one of his uh, fast deterministic approximation of a posterior. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different beast compared to sampling algorithms like MCMC, SMC. It's not going to be exact in the limit as the number of samples go to infinity, just some fast approximation you compute, it's deterministic. And um, so you could also, uh, we could also mention a variational base or expectation propagation, this kind of thing that comes more from machine learning. What is nice about in, in LA is that uh, it comes from, uh, it really comes from uh, some statistical um, understanding of your model, right? So you have, you have you look at these special uh, models where you have a latent variable, which is Gaussian, and also typically that has Markov properties. So for instance, think about a territory like uh, France, and uh, you divide this territory in cells, like uh, 
cities or uh, departments. And for each cell, you have a latent variable, which is uh, the propensity that uh, this population to have a certain disease. And so the Markov property is here to say that uh, these latent variables, they're related, they're correlated, but you depend only on your neighbors. Like uh, if you're in Paris, it depends on the department of the north of Paris and the south of Paris, but not Marseille. So you can encode this Markov properties by uh, through some properties of your uh, Gaussian distribution. And um, so your posterior is going to be the distribution of X, your uh, your latent variables from here have a special model. And also you might have some uh, fixed parameters in a vector theta, which typically is low dimensional. And the big insight is that um, if you fix theta and if you look at the Laplace approximation of the posterior given theta for x, uh, it's going to be pretty good actually. And uh, this is because um, for this type of special model where you assume this quotient latent variable, etc., the quotient Markov random field, the prior is quite informative. The, the dependencies between your neighbors, this local uh, special dependency, is really given by the prior. And the likelihood, the data that you observe at each part of France, for instance, is informative the, the state at each location, but this not really informative on this dependencies. Uh, so because of this, the Laplace approximation uh, works pretty well. And then uh, in Inla, you build on this, you leverage this to, uh, so you do that fix for fixed theta, and then you approximate the margin of for given theta, and then you have grid of theta values. So I don't want to get too much into the specific details. First, because it's hard to do with what uh, blackboard, and second, I don't feel so legitimate because, as I uh, told you, Alexandre, uh, it's uh, it's really overdue that has developed Vinla for the last uh, five ten years, and it should be it would be uh, in better position to explain all this. I mean, I was on Vinla paper more or less because I was uh, visiting Harvard at the right time and. Uh, as mostly his ideas and his more familiar than I have with this type of uh, nice, special, special temporal model where you could use INLA. But the, the big thing to understand is that INLA works wonderfully for a certain class of models. And um, you understand that if you really have some good statistical understanding of these models, which are called Gaussian Markov random fields. And there are some nice extensions based on the uh, SPDs and stuff like that. And uh, so you have to read all these papers by Harvard to, to make sense of this. And also what is beautiful and that has, um, that had uh, some influence on me, I must say, is that Harvard understood from the start that this method will catch up only if you develop some software behind it where, which will be really plug and play for uh, practitioners, right? So you, you have this ability to describe your model for two or three lines of R. Then you have this underlying inline engine that you run and it will compute systematically your, uh, your approximation. It's super fast. And this is models where MCMC, deep samplers have been developed for some time, but compared to this, they are just 100, 1000 times slower. So there's, there's no, they are not uh, a serious uh, alternative in that respect. So that's uh, really neat. So I'm a big fan, but. I have to be honest again, I'm not the best person to explain, especially the recent progresses that has been made. And what is really important is that software has been developed, which is super user friendly, and it works very well for certain models. And it's not a universal approach, which is why I like it too, because it was very well, it is a good understanding now, I think, from people like Harvard, like, why it works so well for certain models. And uh, this is it. I think that's already useful. And I already put the, the original in the paper in the show notes. And actually, I think that'd be useful for people. So if you know of any good tutorials about Inla first to put that in the show notes. And second, a link to the software that uh, you were talking about so that people who want to try out Inla can 
and experiment with it. The documentation of Vinla is really beautiful and there's all these models for each model and uh, there's an example, there's an ear code and uh, so it describes a, a bit like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, with uh, Winberg Manual, which is pretty famous because it used to have uh, all these models and data sets, example, and for each example, it would give exactly uh, the bugs code to, to implement it. So the doc in that documentation, the data is the same, and that's super convenient. So for practitioner, if your model has already been implemented, you just copy and paste. Oh yeah, well, that's perfect. Yeah. So definitely put a put a link to that in the in the show notes. That's perfect. Sounds exciting. If I'm not mistaken, there are books to buy at Harvard recently uh, that people should check out. I will try to I will add the uh, links to those books. Awesome. Damn the show notes for this episode. That's cool. Anything you want to add about Inla that uh, you didn't mention and feel like you should? Uh, no, not really. Um, I don't feel like I'm. Uh, an important contributor to Inla, but on the end, I really uh, appreciate that working on this gave me a, a different perspective on Bayesian computation and got me interested more in uh, deterministic approximation and to this kind of pragmatic approach and also the idea of uh, offering software. And if you don't provide software for a new method that people might never use it, etc. So it had a very positive impact of my research, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. yeah, I completely agree with that. It's definitely super interesting to have that that other part of the research, which is more deterministic approach instead of approximations like MCMC and SMC. I think uh, it's, I mean, if we can really have both sides, that's really awesome because then uh, it will make pace even more versatile and able to adapt to a lot of different circumstances. So definitely I'm, I'm all in for that. And that's why I think it's important to cover it on the show. Also, because personally, I don't know a lot about Inla, for instance, I'm used, I'm way more used to approximation methods, of course, uh, especially uh, any flavor of MCMC. SMC already is something that I use way less, but I mean, I have a bit more intuitions about it. But Inla is something that I still need to learn and want to learn because it's kind of a different paradigm so yeah definitely curious about it and yeah then then the software part is yeah as you were saying to me extremely important that's also why i think open source software like stan or PyMC are, are extremely important because they allow you to basically outsource the heavy lifting math part that just a, a few people can and want to do. And then for people who are more interested in the code or who just are not very math prone, well, they can code their model up and leave the math parts, which are extremely complicated to people who actually enjoy it and are really good at it. And that's why instead of making your own samplers, uh, using samplers that have been waterproofed by the open source development workflow is actually extremely important. And then I, it's a multiplier of power in a sense, because I mean, I don't think I could work on all the, on all the models I'm working on right now, if it were not for PyMC, for instance, because I mean, I'm not a mathematician. So if I had to develop my own algorithm, that would take me way longer. And I would end up with algorithms that are way less efficient than those I can use right now. So that's cool. I think we're getting short on time. So before I ask you the last two questions, I want to talk a bit about expectation propagation or EP, because that's one of the topics you also work a lot. On. And so, yeah, what can you tell us about expectation propagation? I think you in particular have a paper recently about that. I like the, the title, Leave Pima Indians Alone. It's about binary regression. I put that already in the show notes. So yeah, like tell us a bit about that so that people get an idea of what expectation propagation is and why that would be interesting. Uh, if you don't mind, what I'm going to do is to describe briefly this paper because it's, uh, 
So what we, I had this super bright, super efficient PhD student, James Ridgway. And uh, at the time I had this uh, honest question, which was uh, every time I open uh, a paper on a new method on MCMC, the first numerical experiment is logistic regression or, or probit regression. And also, there are some people who develop several Gibbs samplers specifically for this problem. So I was thinking, at the end of the day, which of these methods should work better actually for logistic regression? And so in the end, we wrote this paper, which was a tentative review of um, all the methods you can use to, to compute a posterior, either uh, Monte Carlo, so exact in the limit, or approximate, including expectation propagation. And um, we thought it would be nice because people are in stats are not so familiar with expectation propagation because it comes from machine learning. And also one point we, so I think to, to make it short, sorry, but two points I want well, in the end uh, we wanted to make is first, what's the point of developing a Gibbs sampler for a given problem if a more uh, generic approach, even like random Trepopolis works better? Because we realized that for the data set that people were looking at, the Gibbs sampler were not performing better. But again, they are more work because they are specialized algorithms. So what's the point? And uh, the second point we wanted to make is, uh, look, guys, there are these deterministic approximation, even Laplace, if you want. Okay, you want to ignore it, but if you use it only to get a first idea of what the posture looks like, and maybe to calibrate uh, your MCMC sampler, it might make uh, such a huge difference. So we were a bit, uh, an, uh, in the end of the day, initially my, my motivation for this paper was to complain about the lack of a benchmarking culture. Like people just come up with algorithms and they don't compare to anything. So that's one point we wanted to make. But, and then the second point, uh, third point was this, I mean, uh, Good look, guys, you're developing a Gibbs sampler for this problem. Are you comparing to other methods? And, and people don't. All they do, they will compare to a, a basic MCMC sampler, but they will not calibrate it properly using this approximation. And it looks like an obvious uh, thing to, to do. And uh, it's uh, so that was the point of the paper. And if listeners could have a look at the paper and uh, Yell at me if you completely disagree, you will not be the first one because the paper is made not controversial, but not everybody was happy with our findings. And uh, anyway, if we could start a discussion in the community about uh, how do we compare algorithm? What is the best approach? If you have two approaches, can you make sure that if your approach is more specialized or require more work, you get actually better results? If you could uh, also uh, be a bit more open-minded about different methods like expectation propagation or uh, because then even if you dismiss it as something approximate, at least you could use it to even just start your chain, you know, to have a good starting point. Why not? Etc. Etc. So that's the point we were trying to make in two minutes. Sorry, it was a bit long. Please <laughs> have a look at the paper and throw tomatoes at me later if you want, but uh, I won't be mad. But... <laughs> I mean, it's a. Uh, I mean, I've st I've stopped uh, talking about this paper. I used to g give uh, talks about it for some time, but um, if I could have, uh, if this paper could have some impact on uh, the community, uh, that would be great. <laughs> or at least create some more reaction. Yeah, I know some people like the paper, but I also know people people who don't. And they stay quiet about it. But anyway. If you're looking for a reaction, the fact that people don't like the paper is actually interesting, because that means at least uh, it's it starts a debate, which is uh, which uh, it seems that you is something you want. Exactly, I'd say that that's pretty positive. And just uh, in a few words, I did not really say what is expectation propagation. It's it's a way to compute uh, essentially a Gaussian approximation to your posterior. Except it's a bit uh, smarter for various reasons than uh, Laplace. It's going to give you a better Gaussian approximation. And uh, it relies on, um, on a factorization of the posterior. So if you have independent data points, you might uh, be able to do it. One big limitation of EP is uh, you have this uh, particular technique to update 
your um, local approximation for a given site and that's model dependent. But for Probit or Logit, we have a very nice solution. So I see. Okay. BEP is a, is a very uh, curious algorithm. I don't pretend I, I understand it fully. And I can give uh, references to uh, recent papers that give a better understanding. But it's pretty neat when it works well. It works super really, really well. Yes. Yeah, so this is more related. So ex ex expectation propagation is something that's more related to INLA, for instance, that's the kind of deterministic algorithms, then to SMC and MCMC, which are more approximation algorithms. And it's also uh, related to variational base. Yeah, yeah, which is also a topic you're working on. Awesome. Well, I think this is really amazing and I've already kept you a long time, so we can call it a show. Thanks a lot, Nicola. But of course, thank you for having go, me. That was gonna, really great. I'm going to ask you the last two questions. Don't worry. It's not finished yet. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, someone I want to have dinner with. So, yeah. First one is if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? Why one problem? I like to work on many different things. It will be a nightmare to work only one problem. I don't know. I have to make a confession. I never, I mean, I hate applying to grants or stuff like that. It's mostly because you have to commit yourself to, to something and I could change my mind and tomorrow work on a different problem. That's, that's the fun part of research. I never know what I'm working to work next. And uh, I don't know. I don't want to commit myself. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm, uh, I mean, that's what I love about academia and research is that, uh, I mean, uh, you can always uh, work on something else and you never know what's going to come next. And, I like this kind of certainty. Nothing in the question, though, says that you should absolutely come into one thing. Could be the first thing ah, okay, that you okay, want. Sorry, sorry. Because you have unlimited time and resources, so you know, like, you can just. And the try, moment, I mean, try I'm more. always excited about the the project I'm currently working, but then I will work on something else, and I will be yeah, excited exactly. about that, etc., yeah. etc. So, but I mean, the stuff I've already said in the show, like um, trying to make SMC sampler work better. That's one of the thing I really. Uh, Mm -hmm. Want to yeah. work on. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I'm not surprised. I can feel your passion. And second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive or fictional, who would it be? Fictional too? Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't get it. Uh, mind with plural or can I, I can have different, I can mention several people. Or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. So in Bayesian computation, Charles Geyer is someone who wrote a lot of very nice papers. And because he's, uh, he's of an older generation, I've never met him. I'd be curious to meet him. So Charles Geyer, there is someone, uh, I love some of his papers. And Seymour Haber, uh, same story, but most people might have not heard about him. Seymour Haber wrote two very nice papers in the 60s about Monte Carlo, which are kind of forgotten. Oh, that's very sad. So I like to meet him and tell him that uh, I've worked recently on stuff that is a bit like an extension of his work. and. Uh, I mean, anyway, uh, if it, to make sense of what I've just said, you might want to have a look at the introduction of, on the paper of uh, integration on Monte Carlo I mentioned at the very beginning. And uh, otherwise, uh, maybe Alan Turing, of course, or uh, Gödel, uh, but he was very shy, apparently. So Sophie Germain. Sophie Germain is a female mathematician, but she used to live close to to the French Revolution, which is a very interesting uh, time in history. Yeah, very interesting, very strange, interesting life, uh, Sophie Germain, yeah, for sure. And the extremely, yeah, yeah, yeah. extremely brilliant woman who, of course, had difficulties doing math at a time where it was difficult for women to work in anything. But apparently our family was uh, let them do it because they were kind of wealthy and so... But anyway, I mean, she looks a very interesting character. Yeah. Also, I'm a bit fascinated by the figure of Euclid because, uh, I mean, it was 2,000 years ago. We don't have, uh, I'm not sure if we could talk at all in any way, but 2,000 years ago, they already figured completely uh, geometry. Just like it was already a close subject 2,000 years ago. I found it fascinating myself. I mean, always... Uh, Greek philosophers and mathematicians, they figured so much. That's always been, I mean, that's always found it fascinating. I'm not sure we'll be able to communicate in any relevant way, but, <laughs> but there are a lot of people I, I, uh, 
I respect. Uh, I like to talk to, to be honest, and uh, yeah, it's just a few names. And, uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, super interesting. That sound like a lot of fascinating dinners. <laughs> so <laughs> feel free to invite me. All right. So I think it's time to call it a show. Nicolas, thanks so much for coming on the show. That was really fascinating. I learned a lot. I'm a bit tired because I had to think a, a lot about math. <laughs> so I need to eat something. But yeah, thanks a lot. I'm sure this was also uh, challenging and interesting for our listeners. As usual, and we said it a lot during this episode, I put resources and a link to our website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, Nicola, for taking the time and being on this show. Thanks for having me. That was great. The new experience to be, but it was very really nice. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You bet. See you. See you. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learnbasedstats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good Bayesian. and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian. Change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation.